So this screen is different today. This screen comes from one of my trusty Commodore 64s. So what I've got in the back here is I've got the user port connector all soldered up so that the bottom side of the user port connector pins A to M for mic are connected up to this little breadboard experiment here. So C, D and E, PB0, PB1 and PB2, port B0, 1 and 2, um, are going into the lower three bits of this demuxer. And then basically I've got four LEDs here. One of them is off because when the program starts up, what it does is that it outputs to port B value zero, which is here, I equals zero. This is the data direction register for port B. And, and this is basically telling it that I want to um, output port A bit, well, bit four of this is output port A2, which is on pin M for mic, as the uh, documentation here says. Um, so what I'm expecting to see is that, yes, I'm expecting to see the first LED off and the other three on, which is correct. And of course, I've got little resi uh, resistors backing this as well so that the output from the demuxer is not going straight through to ground, it's actually going through a resistor because the LEDs, you know, don't apparently have much resist much resistance themselves. Um, like the power LED over there. So yes, the first LED is off, which is as expected. Now um, I've got it waiting here um, for something to be entered. I don't care what it is, it's just as long as it's something. Uh, and then what I'm expecting to see is that I'm expect what I'm doing here is that I'm uh, bringing PA2, pin M for mic, uh, down low, and then I'm bringing it high. What this should then do is that because it's connected here, um, PA2 is connected to the high enable input here on the demuxer. So if I have, uh, if I double check that, it's this pin uh, here, E1, pin six. So when the demuxer is disabled, I then expect to see the LED flash on and then come back off again because uh, I've got this here. So uh, muxer off, muxer back on again. So I should see the first LED, which is currently off, flash when I press return. Yes. Um, and then what I should expect to see is that it goes around this, it's waiting here now, and then it goes around this loop and it comes back up here. So I should expect to see the, the second LED come on now, which I do. And then if I press return, I should expect to see it flash. Yes, I do. Uh, the third LED should now go off, flash. Uh, which we probably didn't see because it was very fast. Um, and then fourth LED goes off, flash. Yes, I saw the flash even on my phone screen. Um, and then I've only got four LEDs. So the other five, six, seven, and eight positions on this are, you know, they're not, con they're not connected up. I'm just really interested because uh, this uh, breadboard is set up in such a way that, again, I'm using this board for a five volt supply because I had to take out the other one to give me enough space to breadboard up this idea. So um, the ground for the five volt regulator goes into the common ground, which then goes straight to the ground on the Commodore 64, which is up here, pin A, bottom side is ground. So uh, all that all that said, uh, the common ground setup seems to work. There is no, um, I'm not using the five volts and I'm not using the nine volt 
um, AC, um, obviously, and I'm definitely not using the, the, the 5 volts coming from the Commodore 64. What I'm doing is that I'm using the 5 volts with a common ground plus 5 volts coming from this board. That means then hopefully I can get this board to power the user port interface. Uh, what it means is that these these lines here basically come into the inputs here and because there's a common ground the voltage that's asserted here is enough to uh, cause the demoxer to actually start working which is you know perfect that's just what I wanted to validate so now what I'm going to do is that um, because I I don't have uh, enough parts uh, because I've got to order all of the ICs what I do have is that I have a bit box so I'm going to be um, you, I'm not going to connect up or, or breadboard up the, the full user port interface, which has the auto incrementing 16-bit uh, address counter um, and all of those goodies. What I am going to do is I'm going to implement a very simple 4-bit um, nibble-wise uh, protocol uh, where, say, for example, the, the upper 4 bits are used to go into the demuxer and the lower four bits are then latched into successive um, latches basically. Um, I've probably got a whole bunch of, um, I think I have anyway, a whole bunch of 74273s so what I will probably do is that I will um, use the lower four bits from the 74273s and I'll latch those out and then Hopefully that will enable me to uh, output the, uh, well that's the thing, is that the data bits, the full 8-bit data, um, I can actually uh, output as a data bus, as the final signal. I only really need to have enough latches for... Um, Hmm, that's interesting. I don't even need to have enough 4-bit latches. Oof. What was that? 4-bit latches. It's probably this thing. Um, something went or something. I don't know. Anyway, enough 4-bit latches um, for the uh, address and maybe the extended memory bus. We'll see how it goes anyway. Uh, but I'm, I'm hoping to breadboard up enough of a simple rudimentary RS2, uh, RS2 uh, user port interface uh, from the Commodore 64 so then I can start asserting and setting memory into the video hardware. Uh, and then I can do some more thorough tests by using Commodore 64. We'll see how that goes anyway. If I, if I don't have enough bits, then I'll just go ahead and order the bits that I really need uh, for the proper interface I think and then probably order the circuit boards and then uh, just sit on my hands for a week or two and wait for the circuit boards to arrive. Okay, let's see. So build progress. At the moment I've spec'd out this simpler schematic for a user port to 24-bit address plus 8-bit data. Uh, a simple interface. Um, it uses a 74138 up here at the top and then depending on the inputs of the lower four bits here on the user port it will then latch in with these 74273s it will latch in the upper four bits the upper nibble basically into the lower bits of each 273 and then because there are eight 74273s, what this does is that it gives me eight divided by two, obviously. Um, it gives me an extended memory bus byte, uh, two bytes of address, and then say, for example, uh, two bytes of data. And then there's a little uh, test RAM set up here just so I can see that the data bytes go into the correct addresses of memory um, when the correct extended memory bus byte is asserted here. And what I've got is that I've got a couple of um, pattern generators up here uh, take, taking in, these are the pattern generators and, and these take in the input files here. So when I 
execute this schematic. It feeds in all the pattern here. And then if I pause the execution, I can see that these two bytes have been correctly written into the correct memory addresses. So this schematic um, I've quickly prototyped and I'm going to quickly teleport over there now. One moment, please. So this relatively large breadboard is the same. So over here on the left, we've got the demuxer. And then we've got all of the 74273s all over here. And there are eight of them, obviously. And the user port here. So I've just completed testing this with the Commodore 64. Um, just basically using the logic analyzer to make sure that the correct byte values are asserted here on this very wide <laughs> um, data and memory address bus interface. So um, it's getting quite late, so I'm not going to connect this up to the video card hardware just yet, but I plan to do that tomorrow. But all of the tests on the Commodore 64 were good. Um, it all seemed to work rather well. Surprising, really, considering the great big mess of wires that we have here, but okay, you know, it was not too bad to construct. Um, it was getting to the stage where I thought I might run out of jumper wires, but I seem to have enough jumper wires, which is a good thing. Um, this memory bus interface is not going to be the, the final one which I use. I'm going, I'm going to build up proper boards for the, for the um, auto-incrementing memory bus interface. At the moment, if I want to uh, send one byte into memory, I you know, pretty much have to update at least two bytes, and that needs at least four different writes, uh, because the uh, yeah, because the um, the high bit of the low nibble is used to toggle the demuxer here, so that I get a good, reliable, uh, positive edge for the 74273s to latch the relevant number of bits. So, um, a, a, the more expand uh, the more expanded. Uh, schematic for the proper user port memory bus interface and actually relies on the um, one cycle uh, low to high transition of uh, I think it was the PC2 line which is you know a better way of doing it and it actually relies on an internally uh, an internal uh, clock to cause the correct sequence of writes to to cause the output memory and uh, memory write uh, on the memory bus here. But this is a simpler interface which uses uh, a lot more writes and it uses a 4 bit you know, kind of like interface to allow the Commodore 64 to finally control all of the uh, memory write lines. And uh, because the memory write line is uh, going to be uh, controlled by uh, this line up here which is uh, pin M on the user port, which corresponds to PA2. Uh, so I can tweak this one. Um, but yeah, the, the proper user port memory bus. Um, you know, if I'm writing bytes sequentially through memory, it only needs the Commodore 64 to write the full eight bits to the user port all in one go. There's no extra tri tri uh, twiddling of uh, address bus lines or, or user port lines from the point of view of the programmer. They just need to write a byte and then that byte will get written sequentially through memory because the memory uh, memory address auto increments. But this one there's no auto an auto no auto incrementing at all. So it's you know it's theoretically easier to prototype because it's just um, the demuxer and then the 8-bit latches. Um, but yeah. 
it, it's still taking quite a lot of wires. <laughs> but so yes, tomorrow uh, connecting up the extended memory bus plus the 16-bit address plus the 8 bits for the data plus the uh, memory write line here which goes into PA2 and then um, potentially also uh, hooking up the uh, V-Sync into flag 2. So flag 2 uh, comes here on the second wire which is the yellow one. The yellow one here, this is the second wire. So that's a read sense line which is hooked up to the Commodore 64's um, NMI. Right, but basically I can use the V-Sync output from the video header here and then just tie it over into there which will then let the Commodore 64 via the uh, non maskable interrupt NMI uh, line to then uh, detect properly that, that there is a V-Sync on the video card hardware. So anyway, do that tomorrow, it's rather late, I'm rather tired now, um, so see you all tomorrow. So progress with the build. Um, I've finished using the logic analyzer to test the functionality of the simple memory bus interface while connected to the Commodore 64. So it all seems to work. So now what I've done is that I've connected the, um, the extended memory bus, the 16-bit memory address plus the 8-bit for the bytes to the relevant input lines on the video hardware. Uh, plus I've also connected the memory uh, enable right line to pin PA2 on the Commodore 64. So Oh, what I've also done is that I've um, created a little uh, basic program. Um, I'm going to load it from tape. So, unfortunately, when I was testing this out earlier on, my 1541 disk drive is refusing to read disks. No, um, the head just keeps on knocking around and it doesn't really read anything. It, it managed to read uh, one directory on one disk one time only, um, but I think the uh, maybe the disk heads need cleaning or um, the head stepper motor has just given up the ghost. Um, so anyway, so I'm using my, my trusty old C2N data set, data recorder. Um, so this is the program. Um, Ah, oh, of course it's larger than the screen, so I'm going to uh, list uh, the first, say, up to 200 lines, I think. Uh, we'll try that. There we go. So this program is, is relatively simple. What it does, line 10, up here, I'm going to use the cursor. So the cursor up here, uh, line 10. Um, this sets uh, the data direction register for... Um, the uh, which one would it be? No, oh, PA2. Hmm, yeah, sorry, PA2 pin um, for output. And this one sets port B um, all output, all, all eight bits are output on port B. Um, A percent is my uh, latch address, and B percent here is the uh, byte. So what I'm doing here, is, and then go sub uh, 10,000. So 10,000, what it does is that it basically uh, writes writes the inf writes the byte to the latch address, latches zero to seven. Um, each latch holds four bits, so it does two writes, one for the lower bits and then one for the upper bits. And those are latched into their respective latches, so each latch which holds four bits each then produces eight bytes as a latch pair so latch zero gets value zero what this does is that it uh, latch 
zero and one are, are mapped to um, the extended memory bus. So this clears the extended memory bus. So no extended memory bus lines are asserted. Um, latch two and three get value 64. So that's four zero in hex. So that's the low of the memory address. And then latch four and five is the high memory address. And, and so 144 from decimal to hex is nine zero in hex. And nine zero in hex, um, according to the memory map, with expansion bus set expand with the memory expansion bus is three set to one, um, the extended memory bus basically. And um, up here, first line up here, nine thousand in hex is the start of the one um, k of screen character RAM. Okay. Um, and then basically it loops around for, uh, from 0 to 255. And then what it does is that, first of all, it sets the latch address. Um, again, actually what it's doing is that it's writing the value 64 plus uh, the byte, the B value, and it with 15 into the uh, low byte of the memory address. What this should hopefully do is um, we should see um, different characters being written starting from screen address um, 9040 which should be the most top left hand character of the screen. Don't forget the first two lines of the screen are not drawn uh, because of the border uh, but also uh, and that's to do with uh, uh, the sprite hiding as well. Uh, the top and bottom borders don't display sprites. Um, it's so the sprites can clap, come uh, smoothly onto the screen without just clicking on. Um, then this sets latch 6 and its other pair, 7, with the byte value here as B. So what we're doing is that we're writing um, character 0 to 9040 character of index 1 to 9041 and so on and so on until 904F um, for character F and then character 10 will then be written back at 9040. Uh, so then the uh, ghost of 11,000 basically pulses the memory enable uh, write flag which is coming in on PA2 and uh, then after that it it sets the uh, extended memory bus uh, to zero, so it, it turns off the memory bus, so we don't get any contention. Here, the memory bus is switched on just before writing the byte, and then the memory bus is switched off. Then we uh, wait for a string input, so I'm going to press return, and then it goes around in the next loop. If I look at the um, last few subroutines of the program, you can see here that the subroutine of 10,000. Uh, just does basically all of the bitwise uh, calculations for storing the lower four bits and the upper four bits into its relevant latches. There's the latch index plus one uh, over here on line 10,070. Um, and it just does the same thing. Of course, it, it, it writes it twice because uh, this time it's with the uh, multiplexer, a uh, demultiplexer enabled, and then the demultiplexer is disabled. That gives a positive edge clock on, on the latches, so the latches can actually uh, read in the relevant values. And this, as I say, as the REM statement says, strobes the MEWR line. Um, PA2, go low, memory enable, write, and then go high, stop writing. Okay, um, so that's the program. So if I run the program, um, okay, so it won't work at the moment because I haven't switched on the video card. So this is the first time I've switched it on after connecting everything up. Let's see if it all works. Oh, well, I'm getting a good sync signal. And uh, oh, okay, cool. So this is kind of expected. So um, the the state of the latches is indeterminate. Um, so evidently. Um, probably one of the expansion bus uh, rams uh, the probably the expansion bus uh, memory expansion bus has um, 
two zero set somewhere or maybe two one and it's causing uh, contention so actually what we're doing here is that we're just seeing the the residual uh, color information if you like but the character information is being um, held out from from being read because there's contention on the extended memory bus so now if i run this on the commodore 64 if i pull back a little bit if i run this the the initial um setup routine should basically clear the extended memory bus and write the first character and then it should wait for the return key to be pressed so let's let's do that and see what we get look up in the top left hand corner of the screen here bearing in mind there we go good so i saw uh, so now um the memory extent the, the extension memory bus the extended memory bus sorry has been set back to zero now you can see here that latch zero has byte zero just been written here the last line you can see the sequence of bytes that have come through so this is the initialization stage and then this is uh, when it was actually setting up the uh, information to be sent out so um, the low address again being written um, the extended uh, memory bus being set to be one um, the byte being written here the, the memory latch being, and then the extended memory bus uh, being written with zero here. So that's what we see here is that now the video card has hopefully this this one up here in the top left looks like it's been written because it's different to the surrounding um, kind of like pseudo random you know RAM startup pattern. Actually you can see that the information in the RAMs is not completely stable um, when the board starts up um, but it, it's it's going in stripes so these top lines here we've got what was it one two three four characters so it tends to be mm -hmm. two then four 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 two two four 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 two and then this is kind of like a recurring pattern that i see in the rams and i do see that you know this area of the ram is initializing itself uh, differently or or just you know taking whatever value is in the electrons there anyway so that's good, that's expected. That means that um, the memory card, um, or the memory, the, the video hardware, has been reset as expected according to the information that's come into the extended memory bus byte. So, so basically, uh, if I press return now, we'll see that, the, that, if I try and keep both in view, so watch the top left-hand corner of the screen, okay? Um, as I press return, this screen up here, the top left hand corner, the, the, the second character in the top left should change as I press return. And it has. Um, it's not easy to see because the palettes are, are, you know, it's a default green palette and the characters are kind of random, but I did see a character start to march across. So if I press return, the screen blanking out, of course, is because the extended memory bus is being switched in and I'm writing memory to the screen memory. And now normally I should not be doing this during the display portion of the video hardware. Um, because it's basic, basic is taking a very long time to actually do all of these pokes and stuff like that. So that's, and it's scrolling the screen in basic too, as, as the information is, uh, you know, marched up the scrolled up the screen. So it's very slow, so it's noticeable. What I would normally do is that I would do this in machine code uh, during the V-blank. And then during the V-blank, there is plenty of time for the processor to be setting bytes into memory as the video card doesn't need to read from the memory at that particular point in time. So anyway, if I keep on pressing return, we should start seeing characters marching across the screen. So we can see that characters are starting to change. Now, we can see here that, that this one has just changed as well. Um, so if I keep on going through, there we go and it's marching across. If I just zoom in now, I'm going to say whenever I press return so you can see what's happening. There we go. The characters in the top left are changing. Now, it's uh, basically writing um, address 13, 14, 15. And we should start seeing now that the top left hand by because it was ended with 15, don't forget that the memory address now will, will, will cycle back to here. So let's see. Boink, 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 boink. So the characters are changing now, but the, it, it's cycling around 
the first 16 characters. Okay, 0 to 15, so 16 in total. And we can see here that it's going to be writing those ones, yep. Fantastic. This means that, at least for writing characters in the screen memory, that the, the extended memory bus uh, you know, just works straight away without any problem at all. Um, what I'm going to do now is that uh, I'm going to expand this program to now start um, setting things like uh, different palettes. I think I'm going to try and program different colors of palettes, so maybe a red scale, red scale green scale, blue scale uh, you know, uh, palette, uh, different intensities of red, green and blue. Um, and then I'm going to try setting uh, palette information uh, in the color screen. So I'm going to put this on pause for now. I'm going to tweak around, around with the program and yeah, I'm going to try and get some better color information appearing and in better characters. The thing is, is that because my 1541 has died, um, I don't have access to all of my usual dev tools. Uh, like the old assemblers that I used to use and stuff like that, so it's going to be quite hard. Now, I have got an Easy Flash 3 cartridge ordered um, because that's going to allow me to rapidly prototype from sending, you know, comp uh, assembling <clears throat> on the PC and then sending it via USB for a cart image or something like that straight to the Easy Flash 3. So I'll be able to do very large, good tests. Uh, with properly converted graphics and everything, but uh, at the moment I'm just having to rely on putting, you know, values, poking values in via basic, unless I want to hand assemble um, some stuff. Or what I could do is I could assemble something on the PC, hex dump it, and then type in hex on here, and then actually uh, do it like that. Uh, I might do that, put some checksums or something on there, because I don't have any other real, really good way of transferring data from the PC to. Uh, this particular Commodore 64, um, but yeah, it's fantastic. It's working. That I can I can see the characters, um, the random characters, uh, changing up in the top left hand corner of the screen. That's really fantastic. What I might do is I might clear the screen and I might set some characters too. But I'm going to try now try with the palette changing and see if the palette changing works. Really pleased with this. It it worked first time. Can you believe it? It's like, how? How how did all of this, you know, mess of wires um, work first time? Amazing. So what I have here is that I've modified the program slightly so that um, it initializes the palette information. So 156 in, in decimal is 9C in hex, uh, which is the start of the palette map entries in, in RAM 9C00, basically. Um, it goes through the first uh, 256 bytes of the palette memory, which is the first 128 colors from the palette. Um, what it does is that it sets the output byte to be a, a random number between 0 and 255, um, but also divides the number for the color intensity, if you like, um, which could be red or green or blue on its own, I think. Um, it divides it down for later entries in the palette, um, just to give some visual difference on the screen. Um, this here sets uh, the low address latches uh, with the palette index, color palette byte index into the palette memory um, that I want to write. And then it just goes around the loop here. Um, this is fine because the, the eight by eight character screen actually um, has 1024 characters, not the standard 256. And it does this by using two additional bytes, uh, two additional bits, sorry, from the uh, color index, RAM, um, in addition to the two bits being used for horizontal and vertical flip. And then it just basically uh, reserves the lower four bits, of course, for the palette uh, clut. Um, and each clut is eight colors, with color zero in the cut, clut being, uh, color lookup table, uh, being uh, transparent always. So uh, what this means is, is that um, 
it doesn't use the full range of 256 colors in the, in the palette, like the sprites and the tiles can, um, but it does that instead of, uh, so so it, so it, it, it doesn't do that, but it, it does that. It, it, gives the, it gives the user the ability to have 1,024 characters instead. Uh, so that, that's the trade-off for the character screen. Um, which you know I'm I'm quite happy with because it it it, it uses um, all of the available memory from the uh, character bit plane rounds, um, and that's fine because the sprites and the tiles layer can and and actually the mode seven there uh, can use all of the other lower or higher palette indexes anyway, so that's perfectly fine. Um, and then what it does is that uh, I've expanded these loops slightly so that instead of uh, writing into the screen memory at um, 9040, uh, it writes into the screen color memory at 9440, starting at 9440 for the top left hand um, character on the screen. And it writes the first 256 entries, uh, you know, again, in a circular fashion uh, with 64 plus uh, the index and it with 127. So actually what it's going to do is that on the screen, which is currently turned off, um, it should write the first 128 character colors um, from the top left hand character on the screen. And then it should cycle around again. So we should see a very visible difference now. Um, which should really prove that the memory interface is working. Uh, I've removed all of the extra prints so that it's not displaying uh, the latches and stuff like that. So hopefully it'll run a bit quicker. So let's see. So if I switch it, oh, let's switch on. So I've noticed when this is switched on, an awful lot of uh, interference occurs on the Commodore 64 screen. Um, from the from the video board video generator video conversion box, so I switched that on. I now need to switch on the video hardware. Uh, again, we're in this kind of like state where the bit planes are are being asserted, so it's not actually able to read any character uh, character definition data. So we'll just run this and we'll see what we get. So. This is kind of expected. I'm expecting to see uh, the palette RAM being filled with information. So this is what I expect to see. Um, up until that point, the screen's probably going to be off because it's going to be in contention, quite rightly, I suppose. Um, and then down here on the Commodore 64 screen, uh, when it start, when it prints the word colors, that means it's done with the palette entries and it's starting to um, set memory into the color RAM for the screen. So we should see differently colored characters. The character definitions won't change, but they may be horizontally or vertically flipped from what we see from the default. Um, but the color will also change. The palette index being used will change. Actually, the, the upper two bits as well for the character index will also change. So actually we should see changing characters too. So there you go, you can see the colors gradually marching across the screen as the Commodore 64 is writing the character data. Or the correct character color data plus the upper two bits for the character definition. Uh, plus the uh, palette index, clut index basically and the X and Y flips. So that's all really quite funky. It's working really well. I'm very pleased with that. Fantastic. Um, I'm going to save this now as test three, I expect. Um, and what shall I do next? I might try, if I'm feeling really adventurous before I get the Easy Flash 3 cartridge to allow me to transfer files from the PC, if I'm feeling really adventurous, I might try doing a basic copy of character data from the character ROM on the 64 to here and try and mirror the screen that's being displayed on Commodore 64 to here somehow.
yeah, I could do that if I was if I wanted to. There you go. It's, it's finished the loop. Ready, and it's just left the screen in this in this state. So there you go, a Commodore sixty four powering two screens at the same time. Isn't that cool? And, and this screen has a resolution of approximately uh, 256 pixels across and 240 something pixels vertically, I think, roughly, um, maybe 226. Uh, but each eight by eight character, just, uh, eight, each eight by eight character cell can have um, seven colors plus transparent background color. And uh, also have an option of using um, any one of 16 different parts plus 1024 characters, which is a huge improvement over the standard Commodore 64 screen, just in this screen itself. So once I add on the, um, the sprites layer, um, it will be even cooler because the sprites layer for this hardware has the capability of displaying 24 16 by 16 sprites of seven colors plus one transparent, uh, which is even cooler. And, you know, I think I've got confidence now. Oh, things to note as well was that um, I am now using this uh, Fancy Smancy, actually not Fancy Smancy, really quite cheap and cheerful, um, regulated five volt power supply to power all of this. It's not, it's not even getting even slightly warm. So you know, you know, the old voltage regulator, was it 7805? Something like that, um, was getting incredibly hot on the poor old breadboard um, and also on the poor old uh, board, which is down here. I've relegated this board now back into its bubble wrap. So the poor old, uh, the voltage regulator down here. Yeah, it, it really was not happy about supplying so much power. So this, this is a nice power supply um, that I found on Mercer. It, the spec sheet said that it had a vastly reduced ripple and it seems to have a vastly reduced ripple. Um, in fact, you know, the, the, the screen display is actually pretty solid, right? Um, now the source of the interference on Commodore 64, or Commodore 64 screen is interesting. If I switch off the, uh, the video conversion box, a lot of the interference has, has gone especially to my eyes, I mean, to the camera on the phone, it, it's less visible. But if I turn on the video conversion box again, bink, interference is coming back again. Uh, it's very visible on my eyes. It's a little bit less visible on the phone camera. I wonder what it'll look like actually on a big screen monitor, but okay. Yeah, so anyway, cool, right? Um, wow. Again, I'm really incredibly surprised uh, that this is all working so well to begin with. I'm going to rerun this program uh, while it's got all of this stuff programmed. I'm going to see what happens. Okay, yep. Okay, the, the, the palette. Palette contention rules everything. So I think because what I'm doing is that I'm, I'm actually programming all of the addresses in, in the first 256 bytes of the palette without resetting the extended memory bus to zero each time. So uh, there's there's no f screen flashing on or anything like that. It, it's just, you know, the, the, the extended memory bus is saying, give me access to the palette memory and the palette memory address, you know, is, is always sitting there, uh, you know, on this memory address bus here. And it's basically saying, you know, always give me the palette. I don't care. Um, so yeah. I'm really not surprised that setting the palette tends to do this single color thing for the screen, uh, but that's cool. So now, of course, it's setting the same 256 uh, different bytes 
um, in, into the into this area of memory again. So it shouldn't be displaying anything too different, to be honest. Um, so it's just flashing the screen as it's enabling and disabling the extended memory bus, which is exactly what this program is meant to do. So yeah, this is saved as test three. Uh, if I can transfer the files from my tape deck um, via Easy Flash to, to the PC, then I'll be able to preserve these a little bit better. But to be honest, once I start writing um, assembly language uh, and running, you know, bare metal machine code on, on the box, um, all of these test programs should kind of like go away. Um, and I should really be, really be stressed, stretching um, the character you know, character rendering layer um, because what I'm going to do is that I'm going to be using my uh, prototype code, uh, which is the simulation. No, I'll be using, I won't be doing the simulation in Prote Proteus. Um, I'll be using the emulator that is written in Java with the JDK uh, and the SD and the whole, you know, video hardware SDK. Um, I'll be using that to prototype some decent, you know, character screen graphics. Um, and then I'll be using the Easy Flash to send over those exact same code to here. It does mean that if I want to use uh, the, the code that I've got currently with the assembly language for the video hardware, the video hardware um, in, in Java emulates the full memory bus interface. So um, if I'm feeling really adventurous, that means that I might just eventually throw away this simple memory bus interface and use the full memory bus interface. Or I could switch the emulation into using also an op optional thing to use the simple memory bus. Uh, I could do that too. And then I could uh, change all of the standard code in the video hardware interface library to use either the full memory bus interface with the auto incrementing uh, address um, and byte storage or use this 4-bit memory address bus protocol. I have that option in software. Mm, maybe. I'll, I'll see how it goes. I think what I really want to do is that I really want to order the PCBs now for the full memory bus interface and, and then you know get, get this properly connected and, and everything else. So I'll probably do something like that too. But um, I also might hack something up to also do stuff with this. Oh, we'll see. Uh, yeah, we'll, we'll play it by ear. It depends on how quickly the Easy Flash 3 comes uh, compared to uh, the PCB and the components. But yeah, I'm really, really chuffed two bits with this. Uh, it really is working very well. So cool. Just for completeness sake, what I'm going to do now is I've just reset the board. So I've just quickly switched it off and on. And you can see here that uh, the, the data pretty much um, gets reset in the RAMs to be stuff. And it's got a nice pink screen this time, which is rather interesting. So what I'm going to do just for completeness, I'm going to show the Commodore 64 running the code and what it looks like when the car or when the board is video board is being programmed with all of this data and you can see exactly how slow it is so it's what 38 seconds 39 40 seconds into this i'm going to start it now so the first stage is programming the palette with all of this pseudo random data so this takes a little while because it it sets the first 256 bytes in the palette of memory And uh, as discussed before, when setting the palette, uh, RAM, um, it causes, you know, very obvious contention in terms of, I'm just going to read <laughs> the, the, the current palette color being set on, on the memory bus um, because the RAM is not going into read mode, it's just being forced into write mode. So it's just the rest of the pixel logic, including the, the pixel ladders, etc., are just reading what was on the memory device at that particular point in time. So now what it's doing is that it's programming very slowly 
the first four lines up in the top left hand corner of the screen with color data only, so the character definitions are not changing. And of course the screen's flicking up now, it's doing the characters, you can see here it's just the Commodore 64 has started printing characters. So now it started setting the characters and now it's setting the character bit planes. So you can see it's starting to build up the first character and then it starts building up the smiley face. If I zoom in a little bit here and then it starts building the Christmas predator. Cool stuff. That's interesting. Uh, this time round, it seems to have um, erroneously set something up here. Now, is that to do with missing the memory write signal? This is going to need some further investigation. I'm not overly worried about that, but it is interesting. I wonder where that came from. It might have come from memory. Let's let's just give the program a little bit of a list. And what I'm going to do, oh, I'm just going to run it again from the very beginning. So 17, and we can see if we run it again from line 17, so I avoid the, the palette uh, RAM changes, and then I change this. So now we're just setting the colors in RAM again. row by row. So I don't think it was the color. Dunk, dunk. No, there we go. It was setting that particular byte in the character screen. Now, what that might be is that there may be some uh, spurious interference. There might be a bug in my basic program. Um, Although I doubt it because it was the third character, 0, 1, and 2, in the top left hand corner, which was not set. So it was when it was setting the character data, a uh, character screen data, not the bit planes, that's when it corrected the Christmas tree. So, yeah, interesting. Um, as I say, I think it's probably some spurious noise interfering with all of these wires here. Um, because obviously this kind of, you know, rat's nest is, is not optimal <laughs> in terms of signal integrity. Um, and, and, you know, it might have just been a, me knocking the desk or you know, some RFI or whatever. Anyway, the second time around when it wrote the data, you can see here now that uh, it's back to what it was. Um, so, yeah, I'm not, not overly worried, not at all. Um, of course, when I build the proper memory bus interface, then integrity of data being written to this will be of paramount importance. Um, it may have also been a weird interaction between uh, me trying to write the data um, while the video hardware was active and accessing it might have been anything. Anyway, so the integrity of data written to this via the proper memory bus interface with the auto incrementing uh, memory address will be of paramount importance. So of course that will need a lot of testing when I build the proper PCB. Um, however, not worried about that at all. Not right now, because of the mess of wires. Anyway, so there we go. That's, that's for posterity now. Um, it took a long time to, to actually program the information, but you know, basic is quite slow, especially with the screen enabled, um, and especially using, you know, not very many integer variables. Um, it's, it's really quite ponderous. But then again, it's, it's not really known for its speed, is it? <laughs> okay, so anyway, um, yeah, as I say, I think I'm going to go and fix my 1541. Uh, see if I can actually get a semi decent assembler working from one of my old work disks. 
because um, I'm not entirely happy that the old 1541 is dead. Um, or partially dead, anyway, so we'll see what it goes. That, that might actually involve some YouTube videos as well. Yeah, we'll see. I've just finished saving the basic program as a test 9. So it contains all of this. This contains some extra character definitions for the letters A, B and C. So we have a good video signal sync here. We have the usual power on state for the video hardware that is just showing the the color information from the color screen. So I'm going to start the execution now. Programming the palette first. I'm going to zoom in a little bit on the, on the screen. Well, maybe not because I also want to show the Commodore 64 screen updating. It takes a long time to program the pilot. 256 separate memory locations just for the first half of the pilot. The first 128 colors basically. Okay, now it's setting the values into the color RAM. The first four rows for the first four, for the first 16 characters. <coughs> now it's setting the character screen. Again, the first four rows, for the first 16 characters. Now it's setting the character bit planes. It's programming the first character, so character zero. Now it is programming the smiley face. Now it's starting to program the, what's meant to look like a Christmas tree. Now it's programming the letter A, the letter B, Eventually, here we go. And the letter C. And then the Commodore 64 says it's finished. So, up here, if I zoom in and focus, then you can see there, there's no flip here. Horizontal flip, vertical flip and combined horizontal and vertical flip, which is pretty cool. You can see it quite clearly on the uh, smiley face because I put one different colored pixel up in the top. It's top left, my top right, the smiley. So you can see very easily. And the letters as well show this quite nicely. So uh, yeah, very pleased with that. Looks quite nice.